Alyssa Guardiola. I am a consultant with LSAT Unplugged. I have been an LSAT Unplugged course member for almost nine months now, and I also am a TA. Basically, the biggest difference between a TA and a consultant is you can email me. You can email me at admissions at LSATunplugged.com, and if anybody has any questions about tonight's interview or they want to reach out, this interview is being recorded and will be posted on all the social platforms. Uh, I'll go ahead and get to it. I'm very excited and thrilled to uh, introduce a fellow Texan, uh, Sean Adams, the uh, Assistant Director for Recruitment at Texas Tech University School of Law. And welcome, Sean. Happy Wednesday. And why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about your role at Texas Tech School of Law? Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for that introduction. So I work obviously in recruitment for the Office of Admissions. I am also on the um, admissions committee, so I'm um, reviewing files and things like that. But my job typically pre-COVID, uh, I travel all over the place. I go to pre-law events. I go to LSAC forums. Um, I just travel all over the place and uh, you know, try to look for students that we believe would be a great fit within the Texas tech law community and uh, answer a lot of questions. <laughs> and so uh, ever since we moved to a COVID world, uh, we've been doing most of that online um, because a lot of the fairs are not happening in person. We've been doing LSAC forums online. Uh, everything has pretty much gone to a lot of different platforms. Uh, but if you are looking to speak with admissions professionals, uh, those are definitely, there's a ton of fairs that are happening. There's career fairs. We're not doing as many uh, grad fairs as we used to because we found that a lot of the students are not attending those for law school specifically. Uh, so interesting. We, yeah, we found that it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot better to open up our calendars to do one-on-one -on -one meetings with students and really answer the questions that specific students have about their situation, questions that they have about our program, uh, our specific clinics and everything else, then, you know, sometimes we were sitting there for an hour and just not doing anything. So uh, that seems, it seems so bizarre <laughs> and to, to hear that, because I know that there's so many people and, and talking about COVID-19 and how your role has sort of changed. I, I've been hearing from admissions officers and admissions committee state members, and you're an admission, admissions recruiter, that the number of applicants has risen. Do you find that to be true also for your school as well? What's the trend? 100%. We are up at least 20% in applications this year alone. Um, I, I can say that a couple of years ago, we'd get 1,100 applications, and um, I know that we have already reviewed 1,500, um, and we're still reviewing from, you know, March applications, um, and we're still accepting applications through May 3rd, and it's the 3rd this year because that falls on a Monday, so <laughs> that's why it's that kind of odd date, um, but we're going to be reviewing files for quite a while, um, wow. and so yeah, it's definitely, there's been an uptick. And I remember, so I went to law school, uh, I started law school in 2011, graduated in 2014 from Texas Tech Law. And of course, when I was applying, it was, you know, at the very end of the Great Recession. Yes. And I can tell you that everybody was going to law school. Um, there were tons of applications. My class was a lot larger coming in. We had about 240 um, students in my class, and now it's around 150. So smaller classes, um, but yeah, we're seeing the same thing as what happened during the recession um, during COVID. So I think people, when there are fewer jobs out there uh, or you know, people have more time on their hands, they're thinking, okay, now is a good time to go to grad school. So. You know what? This is incredibly rewarding to hear you. I had the pleasure of looking through your LinkedIn account just to see what you've been up to. And if anybody's listening right now, Sean is an incredibly impressive person who's had a, a lot of jobs, it looks like. And, and you've done and, and worn a lot of different hats throughout your, your career. And I'm, I'm happy to hear more about that. But to hear you speak about the Great Recession that a lot of us experienced in that 2008 economic crash and you being an incoming um, student for your law school experience, knowing that now and sitting here speaking to you, it's, it's, it's sort of a relief. I'm gonna just call it out for anyone applying right now because in terms of those big numbers, I know a lot of people are 
scared. They don't know what to expect. How would you say uh, the application pool, would you say it's becoming more competitive or is it just more sheer numbers? I, I think it's more sheer numbers. We have, it's a mixed bag because we definitely have people who are um, you know, more competitive this year. And we're also seeing a trickle down effect because if anybody has been paying attention on Reddit or any of these other forums, um, you hear a lot of people saying that this is one of the most competitive application uh, cycles ever. Uh, and so students who were getting into tier 14 schools, um, you know, are suddenly going to, you know, T50 schools and things like that. And so it's pushing students kind of down the line um, so, I mean, and I have my own opinions on the U.S. News and World Report rankings. Um, I think that those rankings are not the end all be all, but I know that a lot of people live and die by them. Um, so, yeah, a lot of students are applying to schools that before would have been their safety schools and now might even be their reach schools. So it's been an interesting thing. We've also seen quite a few people who were not prepared to uh, apply to law school. And so they signed up for the LSAT, didn't spend a lot of time practicing for it, just took it, maybe didn't get good numbers there. Um, we're not that academically uh, prepared for law school, but they were throwing their hat in the ring anyway, because, you know, it's a good time to go. So um, we're it very much is a mixed bag. Um, I do like to tell people that they're having reasonable expectations for getting into the law schools that you're trying to get into. Um, this year, I think that's been a little bit weird because with the LSAT flex, I don't know if you guys talk much about the LSAT flex, I'm sure that you do, but um, we've been seeing an increase in numbers across the board on scores on the LSAT flex, which is interesting. And I mean, that's not just for our school, that's across the board. Um, and so, you know, some people are getting higher scores, so they're applying now. Um, and so that's kind of also bumped up, I think, you know, people's expectations. But there is a really cool tool that I don't think many people know about. Um, and if you just Google LSAT GPA predictor, those three terms, set those in Google, there's going to be two different um, predictor tools that will pop up. One of them is from the LSAC, and that's the one that I prefer because they're using the most recent data. Um, and I'm just going to drop that link into the uh, chat box right now in case anybody wants to look at it. But Incredible. here you can plug in your GPA, which you should know your GPA. Um, although if you're applying through the LSAC and you attended several schools, your GPA might be a little bit of a surprise because they recalculate. But plug in, <laughs> plug in your GPA and plug in your LSAT score. Um, if you already have an LSAT score, plug that in. Plug in your top score because that's what most schools are going to take. Um, but if you're doing practice exams, plug in what you are scoring now. Um, or what you hope to score, and you could play with this thing all day long. So you can make those scores go up and down all day, <laughs> but it will show you the likelihood of getting into all 200 ABA accredited law schools in the US. So it also helps you set reasonable expectations for getting into those schools. So you're not horribly heartbroken, or you're not aiming too low for the schools that you could possibly get into. I hope that made sense. You know what, that was brilliant. I thank you so much for just suggesting that calculator and, and just typing in literally, she is Sean Adams has put the Google link here, the link to get into that LSAC calculator. It's incredible that you mentioned these different options in the different schools. And something that I've heard you say before is that the median LSAT score, LSAT score, for Texas Tech University was climbing. It was climbing a little bit here and there. And it's interesting to also hear you talk about this trickle down effect and sort of where applicants are landing in the overall process. Um, so Sean's also just dropped a link in the chat, um, seven stage predictor. It's the same type of tool, but it's just a different company. So yes. It's, it's really incredible. I know that all the time people are asked, wondering, where can I go? Where can I go? But something that's also really interesting about that calculator that you've just suggested that I think a lot of people are not considering is how many schools might pop up that maybe was off their radar. Yes. 
Yeah, there's a lot of them. I, I know myself, I will talk about myself because I'm from Houston, Texas um, and coming from Houston. Are you from Houston too? I'm from Austin, Texas. <laughs> Austin's also okay. amazing. I lived there a couple of times, but <laughs> coming from Houston, um, I'm going to be completely honest. I had never heard of Lubbock before. Um, I'd heard of Amarillo because I knew it was like in a song, a country song, but <laughs> I had not really heard that much about Lubbock or about Texas Tech until I started looking into law schools. And, um, you know, always do your research when you're looking for law schools. But the three things that were the most important for me when I was, you know, narrowing down my list of where I wanted to go, I wanted to get out with the least amount of debt possible. Um, so I was looking for the lowest total cost of attendance that I could find. Um, but on top of that, I didn't just want a cheap law school, I wanted a great law school. So um, the other two things that were important were getting a, it, like passing the bar and getting a job. So I yeah. looked at bar passage rates and then I looked at employment rates coming out and Texas Tech kept popping up on all of those. And so that's when I started looking at Texas Tech. And like you said, using these predictors, you may come across schools that you've never even heard of, never even thought of. Um, but it really does tell you, you know, these are places that are in your, your wheelhouse that you should really be looking into. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, getting in with the lowest cost of attendance is always great. <laughs> like you want to come out with the least amount of debt, but you also want to make sure that you're going to a school that has great bar passage that prepares you for practicing law and that actually helps you get a job when you get out. So Absolutely. I want like angels to come out singing and, and actually what's really interesting about this of uh, like conversation, Sean, is you read my mind. I knew that you were from Houston and I myself am from Austin and being from bigger cities in Texas, I can only speak from my own personal experience. I absolutely wanted to ask you, what drew you to Lubbock? Why were you looking at Texas Tech <laughs> University? Because big cityers maybe are not thinking about others, other cities and possibilities. Absolutely. Um, Lubbock, for some people, for a lot of people, actually, Lubbock is a big city because it's 350,000 people. Um, it's a big college town. But for me, coming from Houston with like 4 million people, uh, it was not big. Um, right, but right. I actually, so I got into six law schools that I had applied to, um, and I only had the time and the money to visit three of them. Um, and so I had to be strategic about it. Texas Tech was the last one on my list, and it was because it checked off the boxes for bar passage and for employment rate, and it was very low cost. But since I had never heard of Lubbock and had never been here, um, and I wasn't big on YouTube or anything at the time back in you know 2010 when I'm making this decision, 2011, um, sure. I had to go and visit. And so I visited my my top school that I got into, um, and I you know scheduled a visit and all of those good things. I went and no, I'm not going to tell you the name of them, but the students were kind of miserable looking. Um, they, nobody was smiling. Um, I felt very out of place walking in there. I'm a first generation um, college and law student. So, you know, I didn't have anybody that was kind of guiding me along in, in this. And I had such a bad experience at that school for that visit. I decided I wasn't going to go to law school because I thought this is what all law schools are like. And if this is what it's going to be like, I don't want to go. And a good friend of mine told me I was being an idiot and that I need to go and visit the other schools. And so I visited the second one on my list. And this is when I found out, which is very true, all law schools have a very different culture. Um, and so one might feel completely different than another. And the second school was better. There were people that were sort of smiling. I felt a little bit better, still felt out of place, but I was pretty much sure I was gonna go to that school, um, you know, cause it was so much better. And I was like, I can do this for three years. Um, I begrudgingly drove eight and a half hours from Houston to Lubbock. It's really and big. There's okay. nothing in the middle of <laughs> driving out here. So all of a sudden it's kind of deserty and I'm like, what am I doing? Um, but I get out to Lubbock and it's, it's a city. It's like a big city. And I get to the campus. I, if you have not seen Texas Tech's campus, it's gorgeous. Um, and then I got to the law school and I did something that none of you should ever do. So do not do what I did. I showed up without having a tour scheduled. And so I was going to be that creepy person that just kind of walked around the halls and checked it out. Um, and I walked in the door and there were a group of students off to the side, just talking to each other and they were laughing and whatever they smiled. They stopped. They smiled at me. They asked if I, they could help me find anybody because they assumed I had a meeting, which I should have. 
Um, and when I told them now I, I'm admitted, but I just kind of want to check out the school. I don't have a tour scheduled. They gave me a tour. They walked me around. They introduced me to their friends. And I decided, okay, so people here are super friendly. It's a lower cost of living. I can get out with the least amount of debt. I can pass the bar and get a job. I'm sold. So that's how I chose Lubbock. That was very long-winded and I apologize, but. I wanted every part of that story. I cannot <laughs> say thank you enough. I know it's, and I hope that people really understand how big Texas is and that you drove eight hours through the desert. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for explaining Bye. that as well, because I'm from Austin. I've never been to Lubbock. I've never been to the Texas Tech uh, University campus. And to hear this story right after an economic crash, where the general feelings, like uh, nationally, there was a sort of tension, right? There's, there's, a, there's a national tension, and here are students in a law school program that had the time of day, and this is something I think, I think it was a really important story that you just told, so thank you so much for sharing that. That was really a blessing to hear. I fell, I fell in love with it because of the people, but I think the important thing is whenever you are looking at your law schools, hopefully one of them is Texas Tech, hopefully you'll come here, but find a place where you're comfortable because it's three years and it's a grind and it can be, I don't know if you know this, it can be very stressful. And so going to a place where you feel comfortable, where you have friends, where people, Lubbock is super friendly and it freaked me out when I first moved here. Um, because I'm, I'm from Houston. You don't really talk to strangers and, you know, coming to, to Lubbock, everybody is super friendly. Um, and it was just, it's a different, uh, it's a change of pace. There's no traffic, which I love. You can park right next to the law school, which I love. And you live within, you know, five, 10, 15 minutes of the law school, which I love. Well, that sounds really incredible. I am from Austin, <laughs> but I did spend a lot of time in California and the traffic situation there is much different, especially when you're trying to juggle a school program and maybe something else. So all of that being said, you're touching on a lot of different questions that I personally have. <laughs> and I, I hope that we get to them all tonight. I feel like I could talk to, to you for hours, which is exactly anybody listening to this, what you want from somebody and an admissions committee, right? So something I've, I've learned about you is that a lot of your roles seem to be a role of support. You've yes. been a teacher, you've been in the Peace Corps, you've been a mentor, and you've also served underprivileged communities, done outreach programs. It sounds like you are maybe someone who has a, like a server heart, like someone who like leads to support others. So you're nodding your head, like yeah. that's absolutely correct. So your role, you're both a recruiter and also on the, at the admissions committee. And it's also my understanding that you also train other recruiters. Is that all correct? Yeah, sometimes we do have, um, we actually have SRCs, which are student recruiters. So it's a student recruitment council. Um, and we've not used them as much during COVID, but prior to that, you know, they were going to our events. They were um, sometimes going to fairs and, and talking to people. And of course, um, since COVID, we've been doing Zoom meetings with them. So um, I am going to drop a little link onto some of the videos that we have um, on our virtual events webpage. Uh, we recorded, I recorded some how to videos. Um, alongside other admissions uh, professionals from other law schools, but we also have the TTU law preview. So we have students who are talking about their experiences in law school, um, first gen experiences, what they've done in clinics. Um, we've had alumni talking and faculty talking, uh, but yes, we also have, um, we have some seasonal recruiters, which uh, we're about to get a new one. So we don't have them yet, but we'll be training them up. Um, so they'll also, when travel starts back up, they'll be going out and going um, to visit, you know, some of the local cities. Potential um, applicants. I'm sure there's going to be a large pool for, I'm sure you're going to need more recruiters almost, you know, especially after doing a lot of the work in, in terms of looking at Texas Tech's University School of Law's program and getting really excited about it. Um, so if anyone, all these links, I hope Anna too, and I'll make sure that Steve, we put them at the bottom of the YouTube uh, video as soon as we do that. Uh, in terms of the student recruiters and not using them as much as during COVID, COVID, it sounds like I can't, I'm not a part of the CDC, so I can't say that we're starting to transition out, but I can assume to a small degree that schools are still trying to plan for post-COVID and maybe like 
for lack of a better word, getting back to normal or getting out of video zone. And so it sounds like Texas Tech is on its way to doing that, including like using the student recruiters and whatnot. It's going to be very exciting when they come back. Um, and we normally, um, I, I'll talk about pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, um, you're able to sit in on a class. Um, so when you come for a tour, you know, we always say schedule your tours. Don't do what I did. Don't just show up. It doesn't work. Um, but, uh, you know, come and, you know, eventually we're going to get back to where you can sit in the back of a class and observe that, you know, a real class, a real 1L class. Um, so you can see the interaction between the students and the professors. Um, and we have our student uh, recruitment council who's able to, you know, give you tours as well so that you do have students. <laughs> That's a shadow. Um, so we do have students who are able to walk you through the building, introduce you to their friends, tell you about their experiences right now and why they chose Texas Tech and how it's going. Um, so I think that those are all really great opportunities. Wow. I, it's, I think it's incredible that we can actually sit in on classes. Hopefully that's coming soon. I'm going to backtrack a little bit and just talk about the rise in the LSAT flex scores. I know that there's been a recent change in the LSAT flex, in LSAT flex where they're adding on Oh, that fourth section um, come August. So I can't do anything but speculate. I'm very interested to see what happens. I know that it's still the experimental section, but I'm, I'm still curious to see what sort of effect that has on the LSAT median and sort of the LSAT trends. But I have questions about alumni. I have questions about Texas Tech. We're an LSAT unplugged page, so I'm going to go back to the LSAT and back to the actual application itself, if you don't mind. Take us back here. So what would you say is uh, Texas Tech's, you know, general attitude towards the LSAT? How important is it? How much does an admissions committee member weigh it in? Do they look at that first or do they read essays for first? Can you tell us a little bit about that? So I think that all the admissions committee members read them in whatever order that they like. Um, and so I do have some helpful hints towards that. But um, yes, the, I'm going to be really, we don't take the GRE, so the LSAT's very important. And your, your GPA and your LSAT are the first step to getting into law school. They really are that important. Um, they do weigh heavily above a lot of other factors. Um, we, of course, review applications holistically. So we're looking at everything. I want to know what classes you took. I want to know what you do with your time outside of work or outside of school. So that's what your resume is for. Um, I want to hear from your recommenders who can tell me about your actual work ethic and things like that. Um, so all of that is really important. And when we're looking for admission, we're looking at it holistically. Now, if you're talking about scholarship, which who doesn't want money to go to law school, right? So that's going to come down to your GPA and your LSAT. And the higher you are above the median, the median is the most important thing. You know, some of our students are looking um, also, you need to be looking at accurate information. And so the US News and World Reports is a couple of years behind in the uh, information they're reporting on school, uh, schools. Um, sometimes it's just incorrect. Um, and a lot of other third party websites are like that. So I'm gonna give you a very big tip. When you're looking at the law schools and you're looking for the medians, you're looking for LSAT, GPA, when you're looking for the cost of attendance, how many people have applied, how many got in, all of that stuff, what you want to do is you want to find the 509 report for the law school for any law school. So if you just put in, if you just Google Texas Tech 509, ours is gonna pop up, you know, and any other law school that is ABA accredited, it's gonna pop up. But you wanna go off of that information and that median LSAT is very important and the GPA is very important. And you wanna be above those numbers if you wanna be not only competitive for getting in, but getting money. So wow. I'm sorry if I went off topic there. <laughs> it was perfect topic. I love these sorts of golden nuggets that you are giving us. I come across so many people. I've been in the course for nine months. I come across a lot of people that are asking questions or I know that Reddit is very popular, the internet and just different sources of information. And it can be really hard to find out what is the most reliable source of information? Well, everyone, we have someone in an admissions committee right here. I hope you're watching this YouTube video. I know that I get a lot when I'm watching interviews, you know, that you've said previously. And speaking of a previous interview, you've said something that I had just never thought of before. And I'm wondering if you can tell everyone who maybe didn't catch that one before about retaking the LSAT, maybe even after you've been given yeah. an acceptance letter. 
Timing is everything when you apply to law school. And most of our application opens September 1st of the year before you actually want to go. So we've been accepting applications for this coming fall since September 1st of last year. Wow. So the earlier that you apply, the better off you are because it gives you time to retake the LSAT if you need to. Um, and that can be, maybe you got denied or waitlisted, not putting that out there on the universe on any of you, but just saying, if somebody is denied or waitlisted, they have the opportunity and the time to retake the LSAT, to study for and retake the LSAT because we take your top score. So if it improves, that might actually get you on the wait list or accepted. Um, now, another thing is if you get accepted and you think, you know, I got accepted, but I didn't get the scholarship that I wanted and I think I can do better. Um, and you retake, we're gonna take your top score. So if yours goes up, that's something that you can come back to the law school with and say, could you please reconsider um, my scholarship based on my new number? Um, if it goes down, it's not gonna hurt you. The one thing I do like to say though, is it costs you time and money every time that you have to take the LSAT. So make sure that you're prepared to do it, You know, using LSAT Unplugged, using Khan Academy, all of these fantastic resources that will get you prepared. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys probably have the same tips of, You'll, I always get asked, when is the right time to take the LSAT? And I think it's when you are consistently getting the score that you are trying to get um, or, you know, better. Um, give yourself plenty of time to take those practice exams. Get a tutor if you need to. Consult with, you know, LSAT Unplugged. Um, you know, get that help. But that's when you take the LSAT is when you're getting a consistent score. Um, and so many things go into it. You know, maybe you had test anxiety that first time and you have to retake, but it does cost you time and money each time. So take that into consideration. Right. But it sounds like it absolutely counts. I love that advice of doing it when you're consistently testing. I think sometimes I, I can't speak for anyone, but I've definitely heard it before. Of, you know what? I need to get this in. And also something I've heard a lot of is, I'm tired of my life being the way it is right now. And I actually personally come across, I love that you're a first generation uh, law student. That is so important to me. It's such a pleasure to be talking with you. I am also a, going to be a first generation law student. <laughs> and Texas, I come across a lot of people that are maybe tired of their lifestyle. They're tired of working and like maybe they have five jobs and they're doing a lot and they just want to get that thick JD. And they've said to me before, I'm tired and I can't go on like this. And something I've said to them, and I'm curious about like your opinion on this is I'm like, you have to ditch that attitude of like, I can't do this. So I have to do this fast because yeah. you're in it for the long haul. Like JD is three years. Like if you're just waiting to pass the bar so you can get a high income, like it's going to be a long time that you're waiting. So I'm, I'm curious if you agree with that. Like you've got to ditch that and sort of like own where you are, where you're at and take it all seriously and thoughtfully. Absolutely. Um, so many people want to rush through the process. Once, once they've determined, okay, I want to go to law school, then they're like, okay, but I want to get in and I want to start. And they don't understand that it could be a year long process to like get prepared for the LSAT. It could even take longer, um, you know, like especially getting good grades in college is super important. And a lot of times people don't think about that until maybe they've actually graduated or they're right at the end of their college career. And then they're like, oh, you know, I think I want to go to law school, but they have a low GPA. Um, right. And there's ways to overcome that. One of the best ways is rocking that LSAT. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to help you. Um, it's not the perfect cure, but it does definitely help. Um, and also writing addendums. Um, that's going to be the other important part of that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah um, you know, it, it takes a while. And so getting into the mind frame of this is going to take me a while to get to, but this is a major goal. Like this is a huge thing. Um, and give yourself the time to do it. One of the things I wish I knew um, coming into law school and what I know now that, oh, I wish I had known this at the time when I was applying, um, I was a one and done with the LSAT. And I had, I, I graduated summa cum laude. So I had a really good GPA in undergrad, um, but I had the most mediocre LSAT score there is. Um, I got into law school and I was excited, but I didn't get a lot of money to go to law school. Um, and it's because I didn't understand how scholarships worked. And coming from a first gen background, I was so excited to get in. Like, I just, I was like, yeah, I'm going. Like, that's it, I'm going. Uh, and um, what I know now is if I had waited another year 
And if I had studied my butt off, if I had found, you know, the right way to study for me, I think another thing that is important about the LSAT is people always ask me, how do you study for the LSAT? What's the best way? The best way is whatever works for you, man. <laughs> so if you can sit down with a book and teach yourself, awesome. I'm not one of those people. Um, Khan Academy did not exist when I was going to law school or when I was, you know, wow. getting ready. Um, but that's a whole program that's free, or you can spend thousands of dollars on a program or on a private tutor or whoever. Um, and if it saves you a hundred grand for a couple of thousand dollars, like I would have had to beg, borrow and stolen that money basically to get that, but it would have been worth it. And I would have gotten a higher score and got money to go. So I think that's important. I, I again, went off topic. No, <laughs> in fact, you're actually speaking a lot to, I, I think exactly what a lot of people need to hear. And I'm not the, um, like the best person because I'm just one person to say what a lot of people are thinking, what's on a lot of people's minds. But what you are saying is, is very, very important. And I'm really glad that you're saying it. So actually I'll ask you a few questions on maybe like that sort of feeling of trying, like there are some factors in maybe a person's life of why they feel like they need to hurry up. Um, like one of them is, is age. So how, how many like non-traditional applicants does Texas Tech have? Is it common to have maybe someone that's been out of undergrad uh, for a very long time? Maybe they're making a career switch. What's that like at your school? And is it okay to wait another year? Maybe some people are feeling that kind of heat. It absolutely is. I know some people like to go from high school to college to law school, and a lot of people do that, and that's great. Um, there's also, and if you Google the average uh, age of law students, you're going to get anywhere between 23 and 28, <laughs> so just depending on what you're looking at. Um, I will say that we've had retirees. We actually like currently have retirees that are in law school because it's something that they've always wanted to do and they got sidetracked with family and houses and debt and all these other things and now that they're retired they're like I'm going to do this now we've also had we admitted a 16 year old who actually ended up going to SMU um, but we've had 18 year olds and so when they're ready to pass the bar is the first time they can go to a bar <laughs> so we also have we have veterans, you know, military veterans that have served for several years and then coming out, they're like, okay, now it's time to go to law school. Um, we have parents. Um, we actually have a lactation room within our law school for expecting mothers and, and you know, new mothers. So we have every single range you could possibly imagine. I went in my mid thirties when I went to law school. Um, so I had already served and I did everything backwards. <laughs> I went to college when I was 25. I served in the Peace Corps. I did a year with AmeriCorps. Um, and then I went to law school. So yeah, there's no, the perfect time to go to law school is when you are ready for it financially, when you're ready for it time-wise with your family, when you are ready to make that three-year commitment and everything in your life falls into place, that's when you go. Wow. I can't say enough thank you for that answer I think that's one of the many reasons that people are feeling that hustle and I hope that they just even press rewind and play what you just said again whenever they're feeling that sort of tension within themselves what do you have to say about uh what do you have to say about like people that maybe they're in between jobs and they want to go to law school? So I'm laughing while saying this, but you know, it's, it's really something that comes up or they don't want to fill in that year with another job because they're trying to focus on law school applications, but they don't want that gap in their resume. So they're just trying to force it and make it happen as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to do, you want to submit your application in a timely manner, um, because I've already talked about, you know, how you get scholarships. Applying September 1st or at the beginning of the fall, um, that's when we have, every law school has the most seats and the most money available. And so that's what puts a lot of pressure on people is they want to get that in, they want to get their application in because they, they want that scholarship money or they want their answers so they know if they have to retake the LSAT or whatever. Um, and then you've got the other people who are applying now when May 3rd is the deadline. Um, you know, so they're like not as concerned about scholarship money as just like, I want to go this fall. I really want to go this fall. Um, again, it just comes down to whatever, you know, your timing is. But I think whenever you are applying to law school, whatever you put on your application is what we're going to see. We do not do personal interviews. If it is not in your application or if you rush through your application, 
and you forget to add things or your personal statements just kind of lacking or you're just, it looks rushed. Um, that's what we're going to go off of. That's wow. what we know about you as a person is whatever's in your application. So if you're not giving yourself the time to do it right, um, to put your best foot forward and to really blow us away with your application, like, you know, it, you get out of it what you put into it. I'll put it that way. <laughs> so, um, you know, if you have time, um, building up those relationships with your recommenders and making sure that they know you ahead of time and what you're going to be looking for on a recommendation letter instead of just like, oh God, I need, I need for us, it's two letters of recommendation. You know, I don't want to tell my boss that I'm trying to go to law school because I don't want to get like fired or whatever, let go. Um, so who do I ask? You know, and they're just like trying to snap through these things. It shows on your application. Interesting. So. I think you're bringing up a really great point. I know that I, you know, there have been times where it just very, very personal no, and excuse me if this is too personal for anyone listening, but maybe this happens to other people. I'm in a Hispanic family and there's a lot of people who are like, when are you going to law school? When are you going to law school? And there's, <laughs> been, you know, there can be pressure at like maybe a holiday dinner party or something of this sort. But something I do think it's really interesting that you just brought up is developing those relationships with the authors of your letters of recommendation. And I actually did not know that that was a thing. I've been under, I've been out of school for about six years. I really was blessed to go to a small undergraduate program where my professors still know me. It's, I wasn't one of hundreds. And when I first started talking about going to law school, they, uh, both of them were like, yeah, let's jump on zoom calls and start having dinner together. And I didn't know that that was possible. I started like freaking out, like, what did I, what if I'm different than, you know, then they remember. And I, I'm not, but I think what you're bringing up is a very interesting point of actually redeveloping relationships with them and it not being a scary thing and actually just being a very normal part of your application process. I know I had never heard of that before. Yeah. Um, and I think there's some things that you need to sidestep. Um, there, there's some issues that pop up with resumes. And if you don't mind me going into those, I like to like give little tips on things. Um, I, my biggest tip ever is when you are applying to multiple schools, go over their website, maybe find their admissions page, look for their frequently asked questions, which I, we have on our page, um, or sit down and talk with an admissions professional if they'll talk to you, um, because you want to know what they're looking for. But I will tell you what Texas Tech is looking for. So on a resume, um, where it's not an employment resume, so that there's a difference in it. So you don't need an objective line because your objective is to get into law school. We already know that. Um, you know, if you're if you've got a skills section, if you've got some unique skills, that's fantastic. Um, you know, if you learn C plus plus or what I, like programming or something like that, that's great. Um, if you're writing down things like Microsoft Word, um, PowerPoint, answering phones. We don't need that. We already, I assume that you have those skills. So you don't need to put that on there. You don't need references because your letters of recommendation are you're going to be your references. So these are things you can just take out of there. You don't have to put your GPA because it's on your transcript. Remember, your uh, admissions committee members are reading tons and tons of files on top of everything else that, you know, if it's professors, they're teaching classes or I'm out recruiting, plus I'm reading files. So you want to make it, you don't want to repeat it. Um, the information that's already on there, you want to give us new information. So when I'm looking at your resume, I'm looking at, yes, I, I do want you to put your education just as far as when, where, and what you got <laughs> kind of thing. Um, if you have employment, that's great. And it doesn't have to be law firms. It doesn't have to be legal internships or clerkships. Um, you know, I've had people that were nannies, people that, you know, worked in elder care, whatever it is, um, you know, those are great, but I'm also looking for how did you spend your time outside of class or outside of work? What student organizations were you a part of? What leadership roles have you taken on in the community? Are you part of a church? Are you part of, you know, some community organization on a regular basis? This is important. If you're just throwing on there, like I worked at a soup kitchen on this Thanksgiving two years ago, that's not consecutive. Like that's not a real commitment versus if it's something that you do every week. Um, so things like that, that's what I'm looking for. And you can even put down hobbies and interests because again, it's something that's not anywhere else in the application. And I want to know if you're a proud dog mom or if you're, you know, a, I don't know, wind surfer, whatever. <laughs> like, those are interesting. Um, 
as far as your transcripts, I'm going to be looking at every class that you took. I'm going to see the grades that you have. I'm going to be looking for writing intensive and research intensive classes. I want to make sure that you're doing those well. Um, you know, if you're not that great at math, I get it. Neither was I. It's fine. <laughs> but um, as far as your letters of recommendation, who you ask is so important. Um, and if you've heard me talk on any other videos, which I'm sure you, you'll fall down the rabbit hole and hear me say this a few times. Um, if you live next door to a judge and your mom is best friends with a senator, unless you have clerked for them or worked for them in some capacity, they are not your strongest recommender because all they're going to do is repeat what's on your resume. They can't tell me anything about your work ethic. They'll tell me, oh, I've known her since she was three years old and she's just salt of the earth and her family is fantastic. I don't know if you show up to work on time. I don't know if you stay late, um, you know, go above and beyond to help others, ask for more responsibility. Um, academically, I don't know if you go above and beyond in research. Um, if you're an amazing presenter, you know, I don't know these things because they don't know them. So again, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I like that you brought up about the resume is the terms of commitment. Um, yeah. There's there's a lot of people that have had a lot of different jobs. I know that I myself have done so many different things that sometimes if someone says, what have you been up to? I'm like, you don't want to know. But, <laughs> but what I'm really hearing you land is the direct correlation to law school and a law program and being a part of the Texas Tech community is a commitment. So yes. you want to prove that you have had successful commitments in your past. Like that's the word that really stuck out to me about the resume in terms of how to format it, how to word it. Maybe if you have like a lot of different things that you're like, what haven't I done? Maybe you could <laughs> bring it down to like, where are you the most committed? Does that sound like the, a good kind of place to start? I think so. And I think um, for those, anybody who's listening to this and you're still in college, this does not like, if your grades are suffering, but you are involved in 15 different student orgs and grief life and everything else, I want you to pair this back and pay more focus on your classes. <laughs> but, you know, if you're in all these different student organizations, you know, if let's say that you build houses for Habitat for Humanity and you've been doing it every summer for three years, that is commitment. It doesn't have to be constant full time, but I mean, you've done it more than once. You've done it on a regular, consistent basis. That tells me that you are committed to activities um, versus, yeah, I did Habitat for Humanity because a student work that I was in like set it up one day. That's not as impressive. <laughs> Right, definitely. This is, I mean, it's really great to hear you say all of these different things. I think it helps pinpoint a little bit more clarity of how to go about writing your resume or a resume and what to focus on. Sounds like leadership opportunities, consistency it might be might be something key and also says more about the applicant than something that like their roommate's brother maybe asked them along to go do like a beach pickup. Um, <laughs> Sounds like that's definitely where the magic is. I also like that you brought up the transcripts. I know that, you know, I was, I've, I've seen before that you've mentioned that you're looking for research intensive and writing intensive subjects. You that's also brought up, <laughs> <laughs> no, I love, I love talking to you and it's really such a blessing. I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to rewatch this later as well uh, because you're saying so many valuable things, but I know that earlier you brought up, say for example, that sometimes people go through undergrad not even really realizing that they want to go to law school and then they graduate and they're sort of that like oh actually I think that that would be a good option for me what does somebody do if and do you look at transcript differently if say they're 10 years out of undergraduate uh, undergraduate program they have no you know writing or intensive research classes uh, do you look at their transcripts differently is there something they can do in their application uh, to sort of help buffer that 100% yes. Um, there are some people who actually go back and get a master's degree later on. Um, if you want to do that, if you have the time and the money and everything else, that's fantastic. And if you make amazing grades, then that shows us, um, you know, that you're ready academically. But here's the key thing. Remember, I told you everything that we know about you is going to be in that application. And anything that you left out is what we don't know. So if I'm looking at your transcripts, and let's say, I'm going to give you some different scenarios. One is freshman year. You got out on your own for the first time, kind of went a little bit crazy, maybe didn't go to classes, partied a little too much. Um, but then, you know, you kind of got it together. Let's say your sophomore, junior year, you figured it out. You started going to classes, you buckled down, your grades go up. 
first thing I'm going to notice on your transcript is that you had a low GPA starting out. Possibly you went on academic probation. There's all kinds of different things. You're going to write an addendum. You're going to explain what happened. Um, I have a formula for great addendums. This is my formula. You explain what happened. You take responsibility if you have anything to take responsibility for. You explain what you did to change things. You know, maybe you started going to office hours. Maybe you started going to tutoring or the writing center, or you just buckled down, or you changed majors because the one that you were in was not the right fit for you, whatever it was. Um, and then you pinpoint like, but if you see my grades trend up, perfect. So you're like, yes, I wasn't mature when I started in law school, or I'm sorry, when I started in undergrad, I was not mature. I wasn't ready for, um, you know, undergrad. Um, I partied a little too much. I just, I was there kind of floating. And then in, all of a sudden I, I kind of buckled down. I realized like, hey, I have some goals in the future. I need to reach them. So I started doing all of these things. And um, as you can see, my grades trend up. That is perfect. It's brief. That's all you need for a grade addendum. Let's say that you graduated 15 years ago and you had, you joined the military and, you know, um, you were not great. You did not have a good GPA back then, but the military helped you buckle down and get mature and, you know, really dedicate yourself to whatever your endeavors are. And, um, you know, when you decided that you wanted to go to law school, you studied really hard for the LSAT and you knocked it out of the park. So you can point to, as you can see, I am prepared back then I was not, now I feel that I am. That kind of helps, you know what I mean? So again, it's pinpoint or say what happened, take responsibility if you have anything to take responsibility for, say what you did to change it and point to the outcome. Um, if you had medical conditions, if you had a sexual assault that, you know, really took you away from your study, like anything that happened. We've had people whose houses were destroyed in hurricanes. We had people whose parents were unfortunately murdered. You know, there's all kinds of things that happen or they're, they, you know, are coming um, through cancer treatments, you know, and still going to school. Let us know these things. Some of those things you don't have to take responsibility for because they are not your fault, but you sure. can still say what happened and then say what you did to come back from it. You know, um, I went to therapy, I um, took a year off and got my health back in order, whatever it was, and then point to where you landed. I hope that all makes sense. But yes, addendums are very important. <laughs> I think you bring up such a fantastic point about clarity. I have been speaking to someone before about maybe like disclosing something if I if we feel like it could help. And I have been met with um, so maybe like a resistance of like, um, maybe like a idea of like, why do I have to prove myself? And I actually want to point out to everyone right now that like speaking to you, Sean Adams, like it doesn't feel at all like uh, proving myself. It just feels like a moment of clarity and that admissions wants to say yes, they want to help and that more information in a clear, uh, thoughtful way with detail and, you know, not too many words, just this is what happened pointing to it, pointing to when the switch flipped, it can all be worthwhile. It sounds like it could have a payoff. I think anytime that we, anytime that we might have a question about something that is in your application, write an addendum and explain it, you know, anything. Um, if you have a gap in your resume, write an addendum and just say, you know, I took a year where I was helping my mother who unfortunately passed away, but I was caring for her at home. Um, and that's why I wasn't working. Like we were living off of her pension and I was taking care of her. And now that she's gone, I've gone back into the workforce. Just explain what happened. If you tell me, you know, I took a year off to go lay on a beach somewhere to figure things out. Okay. Tell me that though. <laughs> like, don't just leave it. Don't leave any blanks. Um, I also saw a question that you had asked about reapplying for students who are reapplying. Yes. And, um, we have nothing against people that reapply, you know, and it, sometimes it's like, man, they really want to do this. Like you can see the passion in it. Um, but do not submit the same application. Don't do it. Don't submit the same personal statement, the same letters of recommendation. You haven't updated your resume. I've already read your application. We've already made a decision on it. Like, what are you giving me? That's any different. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even if you retake the LSAT and your score goes up and let's say that you applied in March, you didn't get in and then you apply in September, like that's not a big window. So maybe nothing changed on your resume and that's fine, but maybe redo your personal statement or write an LSAT addendum. And if your score goes up, 
write an LSAT addendum and tell me what you did that improved it. Yes. You know, always write an addendum. Don't leave me guessing. If you leave me guessing, I have a very wild imagination and sometimes it will not go well for you. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like this point that you bring up and I hope everyone takes what you're saying, you know, to heart and, and understanding that more clarity is just more helpful. And especially with those who are reapplying. I really wanted to ask that question about what do people that are reapplying do? Because I know that there's more applicants this year across yeah. the nation. And so I think it's a fair question that all of us do need to be thinking about that maybe reapplying could be in our favor and it, it could have it I don't want to say it could happen to anyone and of course I don't want to put that energy on anyone but it sounds it sounds like making a thoughtful decision about where you're going to school and making sure that the application is putting your best foot forward yes. is going to pay off and so I love what you bring up about reapplying in terms of not just repackaging the same thing and and bringing it forward even with a better LSAT score maybe there could be something in the personal statement or diversity statement and I I can't believe how fast time has been um, flying with you we've actually uh, had, I had a few questions in the chat but you are a mind reader and you touched base on them exactly which is really fantastic and so I'll go ahead and just ask another question talking about maybe like reframing personal statement and I be for lack of time I will selfishly also add in the diversity statement here you're fantastic yeah. at, at, at speaking on both of them I'm sure so the diversity statement in Texas Tech, it says as appropriate. So right. what does that mean to you? What do you like to see from a diversity statement? And I'm going to add on a personal statement. How personal is too personal? I think with both of those, the key is being genuine. Um, and when we say as appropriate for the diversity statement, um, I have we can read when it is disingenuine. When, when you are just putting something out there because you feel like you know, you should. Um, I had somebody who wrote a diversity statement and couldn't really, they had a very blessed life and that's fantastic. If you don't have anything to put in a diversity statement, don't make one up. And this person, um, it, it felt fake. It felt very disingenuine. Um, they talked about when their family went to Jamaica on a cruise and it was the first time that they'd seen poverty because, you know, they saw people living in dirt huts on the you know, not the touristy side of the island and how it completely changed their life and made them want to go to law school. Um, and, you know, this, this cruise had happened two years prior to when they were applying. Um, but nowhere else in the application had it shown how it changed their life. So they didn't start working with any, you know, poverty centers. They didn't start working with any like charities or student organizations. They didn't do anything differently. And so it felt like nothing had changed their life. They just felt like they needed to put something in there. That was disingenuous. So that's when I say as appropriate. We've had people, diversity means a million different things. So that could be gender, sexual orientation, race, um, people coming from a town of 400 to a town of 400,000 for college. That is a huge cultural shift. And I bet you they learned a new perspective of the world. So that's something you can share. Or, you know, if you came from, McAllen or some, you know, little, little tiny place or from a different country and learning to adapt, um, you know, helping your parents because you speak English and they don't. Those are things you can put in a diversity statement, you know, um, and your personal statement, again, just be genuine and there's nothing too personal. Um, I had a student recently on a Zoom call. He asked or he was saying, you know, I want to tell you guys something that you've never heard before. And I'm like, good luck, because there's not anything that we haven't heard. Um, and sometimes it makes us sad and sometimes it makes us laugh, but, you know, be genuine and your personal statement is your opportunity not to repeat your resume, not to go over what you've done, you know, in college. Um, it's your opportunity to tell us something new about yourself that we can't glean from the rest of the application. So this is your chance to tell me about a special skill that you've developed over years um, or about the dedication that it's taken you to, you know, hone something or some crazy event that just absolutely turned your life around and made you want to do this crazy thing called law. Like, you know, always remember at least one sentence somewhere in the application that tells us that why you want to go to law school. Don't leave us guessing. <laughs> okay. We have, or at least one sentence. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm so sorry about that. Uh, in the in the personal statement that maybe explains or points to 
why you're choosing, why law school education is the reasonable next step for your life. It sounds like um, some, okay, you're nodding your head like, yes. Okay, great. All right. I think it's really interesting what you bring up about the diversity statement. And maybe like, if you don't have something that is bringing maybe a different perspective to that classroom, don't write it. I think you also bring up a great point that I've heard come before. Somebody says like, I don't have something huge in my life, but there's something that you said right now about the personal statement where it could be uh, something you've developed, like a special skill you've developed. It can be a lot of different things. So I love that you bring up, it can be a huge event, but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to have a huge life event to go to law school is what I'm picking up on. Is it okay if I give you two quick examples? I know we're out of time, but I could talk forever. <laughs> I, I, could, I could listen to you forever. So please, yeah, give us two examples and we'll wrap up on that. And uh, I, I also just want to shout out that if anybody is listening to this and wants more, Sean is incredible. And uh, below the YouTube video will be linked, actually the links that she's dropped in the chat here, which is you can schedule a meeting with her. You can talk to her one-on-one -on -one and you can get a little bit more feedback one-on-one -on -one that way. Way, but please, yeah, please give us a few examples. I'm going to make these really quick. Um, one, uh, one of my favorites was somebody who talked about building a flight of stairs. And I've given this example before, but um, he, from the time he was old enough to swing a hammer, was helping his father build houses um, and particularly stairs. And his father gave him that job. And when he first started, he sucked at it. He was not very good. He wasn't dedicated to it. And he made mistakes. And his father would make him tear them back apart and rebuild it. Um, so eventually he learned to do it right. And I didn't know this, but if you're off by just a tiny bit on stairs, like you, people trip and you could really hurt somebody. So his father taught him, you know, you're creating a path for others to follow. You have to do it right. And so over time, over years, he developed these beautiful staircase skills, um, could do spiral staircases and whatever. And at the end of each one, he would look down and, and see everything that he's accomplished, be proud of his work, but know that the house isn't done yet. And so he transitioned and equated that to life. And he said, in life, you have to build a strong foundation because everything builds on top of that. And you're building a path for other people to follow in your footsteps. And you're going to make mistakes, but you have to go back and fix them and, you know, grow and learn. And you can be proud of everything you've accomplished, but know that you're not done yet. You have a lot further to go. And I just thought that was beautiful because what I learned from him without using these words is he's mature, he's dedicated, he learns from failure, he doesn't give up. Um, and, you know, those are great things. Um, yeah, and then there was another one. <laughs> um, first day of an internship, you know, on the way there, spills coffee on themselves in the elevator, um, you know, just about ready to cry and like leave and just skip the interview and just call it quits. And sure. the person in the elevator um, with them, you know, they're like saying, oh my God, I have like coffee all over myself. I've got an interview. And that person said, they're not going to remember the coffee on you. They're going to remember your performance on this day. So just blow them away with that. And um, when they get to the office, that person happened to be their new boss. And so what they learned from that is, you know, it's, it's your behavior, it's your actions, it's your words, not how you're dressed <laughs> that they're going to remember. So that was oh, easy. Wow. I am it. I mean it when I say I just got chills <laughs> in terms of, I think what's also really great is like both of those stories are very focused. Yeah. It, it's a very focused story and it powerfully paints a portrait of that person's core values and experiences. Yes. Oh my gosh. They weren't these giant events. Like you said, they were little tiny things, but it changed their life. So. Wow. Oh my goodness, Sean. I'm deeply sorry that this interview is coming to an end and I'm very, very grateful. I know that we had talked about a lot of questions and I still had more questions, but I'm so excited that I had the opportunity to speak with you tonight. You covered so much ground uh, tonight in terms of admissions and the program and Lubbock. And I'm really just grateful for your time. And if anybody is listening to this and um, wants, there are going to be links down below this video. Sean, do you, do you want to add anything before we leave for the night? I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. I know that people look up to you guys and, and reach out to y'all all the time. And um, anybody that has any questions, please reach out to me. I'm very friendly um, and I don't sugarcoat. So I'm going to be very honest with you um, and hopefully point you in the right di direction for everything. But um, if we can do this again, I would love to. And uh, yeah, just let me know if you need anything. Awesome, Sean. You've been such a blessing to talk to, and I'm really grateful. And I hope you have a great night, and I hope we get to talk again. Thank you.
Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.